Hi everyone, this is John. Welcome to our weekly show, The Subcontinent. We are here to bring light to some of the most important issues affecting the region. Along with an in-depth analysis of the topics and perspectives from regional and international experts, we shall review what key players think and what the common people have to say. In this edition of The Subcontinent, we will be reviewing how shared is the future of the Sino-Myanmar Pork 4 friendship. And we shall look into India's prospects for a Silicon Valley-like digital revolution. Myanmar and China share centuries-old relations. In fact, it is said that the language and culture of both countries comes from a single source as there is a close connection. This is exactly what Chinese President Xi Jinping wanted the people of Myanmar to realize before coming to the country and signing off 33 agreements with his controversial Burmese counterpart Aung San Suu Kyi. But India is worried as it is surrounded by China's influence in Pakistan, Maldives, Sri Lanka and now Myanmar. With numerous investment projects and joint ventures, China is carrying forward the millennia-old tradition of pork for friendship with Myanmar, a Burmese term for tight fraternal ties. And in tandem with it, China is making use of over 2,000 kilometers of mountains and rivers of shared border to expand the China-Myanmar economic corridor. But from India's perspective, a global power is closing in on all fronts. President Xi's visit, a first in two decades, brought about a series of agreements with the Economic Corridor as the centerpiece. This project, along with similar ones with Pakistan and Nepal, provides access to markets with an eye on warm waters of the Indian Ocean. Celebrating 70 years of diplomatic relations with Myanmar, China is selling the idea of a community with a shared future to its southern neighbor, which happens to be its only direct outlet to the ocean, apart from the Pakistan corridor. But a shared future serving whose interests? The interests of the Pork Four Pals? Or China's club of over a dozen border mates? Or an imagined community of nearly 70 countries of China's Silk Road Desk Belt and Road Initiative? Beijing's outbound ventures might be an asset for Naipyidaw, but they may as well turn into a liability, since China already holds 40% of Myanmar's foreign debt of $5 billion. Moreover, such a future can mean strategic encirclement for India, as China's geostrategic leverage is stretching over a wider part of the planet. Both India and China are economic and strategic rivals who are trying to increase their influence in the region. And Myanmar can easily take an advantage of this if it knows how to. But there are concerns that the growing persecution of the Rohingya in Myanmar's Rakhine state and their expulsion from the country points out to a government under the influence of a ruthless military and a powerful Buddhist class, a country which cannot handle itself properly. President Xi wrapped up Myanmar visit with a string of multi-billion dollar infrastructure deals, including plans to develop the Kiok Piyu port in the Bay of Bengal, situated in the Rakhine province from where the Rohingyas were driven out. Now that Myanmar is getting more and more isolated over the Rohingya genocide, what is better than a high-dollar multinational project to further steer the focus away from the injustices suffered by its Muslim community? Perhaps China's deep pockets and outreach may help its friend out of the pit of international denunciation. Panchil Treaty friends, namely China, India and Myanmar, seem to have more in common than they would like to admit. They say they are committed to the five virtues of the 65-year-old agreement – mutual respect, non-aggression, non-interference, coexistence and equality. But discrimination, now more than ever, roams deep in how they treat their Muslims. But how would this new era of ties pan out for over 11 million Uyghurs and about half a million Rohingyas, as well as more than 200 million Indian Muslims? Can intolerance and xenophobia bring about anything but global radicalization and extremism of Muslim youths? 
To have some insight into the issue of China and Myanmar getting closer, we have Mr. E. Sun Oh, who is a senior fellow at the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Sir, welcome to the program. Uh, the first question that I have for you is that China says President Xi's visit to Myanmar opens a new chapter in relations that will lead to a community with a shared future. What does that mean? Well, China and uh, Myanmar traditionally enjoy very close uh, relationship, especially uh, since uh, the foundation of uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, and with uh, Myanmar facing uh, for many years uh, embargo from Western countries. Then uh, around 2015, uh, when uh, Myanmar's uh, military regime decided to, uh, in a sense, uh, democratize, so the relationship between Myanmar and China moved a little bit further apart. Now, of course, China would like to repair that, especially since uh, Myanmar is uh, once again facing the various uh, sanctions and uh, embargoes from uh, Western countries. Well, China's uh, motives, uh, of course, are manifold. Huh? There, there is, of course, this desire to uh, uh, sort of expand its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, but also it's uh, a question of energy security for China to have another access by land uh, so that, uh, for example, petroleum and, and so on uh, could uh, go overland to China through uh, Myanmar. And of course, there's a strategic dimension in terms of uh, facing India. All right, and what do these close ties between China and Myanmar mean for India? What kind of a response do you speculate from India? Well, India, in a sense, uh, is facing two strategic rivals. Uh, one is China and the other one is uh, Pakistan. If I were India, I would, of course, try to be uh, friendly towards either China or Pakistan so they are not facing, uh, in a sense, two strategic rivals at the same time. Yes, you're right. India may have to be quick to respond to this and play some balancing tricks. Um, let's look at the media for now and then we can come back to the question of the session. Through close ties to the Myanmar Navy, New Delhi is keeping the Indian Ocean secure, which is the essence of the Grand Indo-Pacific strategy to slow Beijing. The peoples of Myanmar and China are under no illusions that Pork 4 exists. The new China-Myanmar closeness is undermining New Delhi's interests in Myanmar. Modi and Xi should be applauded for putting the China-India relationship on track. China's practices for overseas projects would not meet their own domestic environment requirements, but they go ahead with them under the rationale that it is the host country's choice. Thank you for staying with us, sir. Um, another question. Chinese president wrapped up Myanmar visit with a string of multi-billion dollar infrastructure deals, including plans to develop the China-Myanmar economic corridor, most notably the deep sea port situated in the Rakhine province uh, from where the Rohingya were driven out. How do you think this would pan out for the Muslim minority over there? Well, China's own development uh, experience, as well as its own uh, multi-racial management experience, have been such that uh, if you bring about prosperity, if you bring about economic development to the part of the of country whereby there's a lot of unrest and so on, with this sort of prosperity uh, swarming in, very soon uh, the people would uh, focus their attention on economic development instead of, for example, nationalistic uh, struggles and so on. So from a Chinese perspective, they believe that uh, I think uh, this sort of uh, model could equally be applicable to many other, uh, shall we say, restive or disturbing parts of the world, uh, including, for example, the Rankine uh, part of uh, Myanmar. So from a Chinese perspective, I think they see this uh, development of a seaport actually as being helpful in bringing about the economic development to the region and therefore reducing the intensity of this sort of discord between the, the Muslim minority and the government of uh, Myanmar.
Yes, we would need to wait and see if that would in any way change uh, Myanmar's reaction or uh, its treatment of its minorities. But thank you very much for being with us. Uh, now, let's go to the social media platforms to hear more from what people think about this issue. Regarding Xi's Myanmar visit, Matthew Tostovin refers to the Burmese village's fear of being ejected from their home due to the stalled projects that will restart as China-Myanmar ties improve. Palki Sharma believes China is expanding its footprint and access to the Indian Ocean and in fact encircling India. However, she doubts about its sustainability. Chinese former minister spokesman Li Jianzhao expresses his country's willingness to enhance bilateral relations with Myanmar to build communities with shared future. This one gives details about China-Myanmar economic corridor and the central road and rail transport infrastructure from China's Yunnan province to Kyuk Piyu in Myanmar's Rakhine state. Thant Myunt Yu believes that the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor, CMEC, will definitely transform the Myanmar's economy and affect the lives of tens of millions. The Indian tech industry has shown remarkable improvement as seen in the Global Innovation Index where India has improved its ranking from being 81st place in 2015 to 52nd place in 2019. In fact, in 2019, the country also ranked third in terms of attracting investment for technology in the world. So what is the reason here and what is the history? Some say that most of the credit goes to the Indian outsourcing industry, which is valued at more than $150 billion. India's brightest tech talents are building up entrepreneurial spirit and engineering skills to create a Silicon Valley-like ecosystem, this time Indian style. Since waves of Indian graduates poured into Silicon Valley in Northern California in the 1970s and 1980s, Indians have made waves in the tech industry, holding CEO positions in the likes of Google, Microsoft, Apple and Facebook. Most of these high-flying engineers had studied at the Indian Institutes of Technology, a bequeathed legacy of India's first premier Jawaharlal Nehru. Alas, those who were supposed to actualize Nehru's dream of Swadeshi, a creed encouraging Indian self-sufficiency, landed in high-paying American jobs, but now the pendulum has swung towards the subcontinent. Home to one-fifth of the world's population and set to overtake China as the most populous country by 2024, India has the largest youth population that helped it consistently improve its global innovation and competitiveness indices. Probably second only to a handful of countries in terms of entrepreneurial potential, India is now replete with unicorn startups including Freshworks, Paytm, Oyo and Flipkart. And applying a model of urban management like that of Bengaluru in other cities may lead to an Indian tech empire. Bengaluru, commonly referred to as the Silicon Valley of India, is the second fastest growing major metropolis in India and the cradle of the country's IT industry. While Indians head major global organizations overseas, such as Google and Microsoft, there are concerns that India is now facing a brain drain. The country was recently ranked among bottom five countries in the IMD World Talent Rankings in 2019. The report showed a drop in rankings for worker motivation and attractiveness for highly skilled personnel. Some critics are claiming that the Hindu nationalist BJP government has created a very hostile and unstable environment in the country with its intolerant anti-Muslim policies. For India to become a digital society, New Delhi has transformed the way it does things. 
India's move towards a new age community, like that of the valley, includes many big initiatives, such as devaluation of rupee notes to persuade the nation to deposit the money stuffed under their mattresses in a bank or enrolling citizens onto a national biometrics database. Cooperating with academia, startups and global organizations, India has launched a center for the fourth industrial revolution to design new policies and protocols for emerging technologies. India already missed the first three revolutions in the 19th and early 20th centuries due to colonial industrialization and the third one when the country did not favor technology. India believes it is now good and ready for the digitally driven one. India's blueprint for a futuristic utopia unfolds like this. India is an AI powerhouse with monetary infrastructures built on a nationwide digital identity platform, fueled by blockchain and cryptocurrency, and mapped meticulously for agricultural info by drones, a whole country connected through the cloud with flying robots delivering vaccines and treatments to remote areas. With digital government comes greater efficiency, but also come the challenges, such as data privacy, transparency and accountability for its increasingly digital population. And whether or not India succeeds depends on how it handles such challenges. Now to have a first-hand analysis of this digital advancement, we have Mr. Mohandas Pai, who since 1995 has been working with the government and policymakers in India to improve the tech ecosystem, and he's currently the chairman of RN Capital Partners also. Welcome to the show, sir. Uh, how is India bringing home its software de developers, engineers, and entrepreneurs to build its own tech empire? Let me give you some data about uh, what India is today. This year, we'll have about $150 billion of software services exports, 4.5 million people employed, about 30,000 IT service companies. This is the second largest in the world after the United States, which has about 6 million people working in IT software. Uh, India has 4.5 million here. America has 6 million, out of which 1 million work for American companies. And uh, out of 4.5 million, about 2 million work for American companies from here. So out of 8 million working for American companies globally, 3 million are Indians. So it is very large. Plus we have about 45,000 startups who created about $160 billion of value. So we have a very, very large IT service and IT startups industry in India. Some interesting facts there. Um, what about the tech scene and entrepreneurial spirit in Bangalore? Uh, how much is the Indian government accountable for promoting and encouraging this technological innovation? The government started off by having an IT policy in 1997. They set up the Indian Institute, Institute of Information Technology under the policy. The government of India created what is called the STPI, Software Technology Parks of India, way back in 1989. And this helped create a regulatory regime where you could import computers free of duty, we could export easily. They gave us bandwidth at the time and bandwidth as constraint and help build up the industry. They also gave a 10-year tax holiday uh, to this industry. And I think the 10-year tax holiday given in 1999 helped us create the capital that is required to grow. On the back of the Indian IT service industry, Bangalore has a booming startups industry today. Like I said, 9,000 startups who created about $70 billion of value. And today about 350,000 people are employed. Uh, right now, I think we are more IT people in Bangalore than in the Silicon Valley. So government policy has been very benign, has been proactive and has helped create this kind of industry. They also set up small funds to fund the startup industry. They helped to create infrastructure in Bangalore. Though we are behind, Bangalore is the richest city in India on a per capita basis because Bangalore has about 8 million vehicles for a population of 11 million. We have our traffic challenges, but government both the federal government in Delhi and the state government in Bangalore have been very proactive, very helpful over the years. Thank you for that answer. Um, let's see how the pundits see India's future and how the media has covered it. And then we can come back to the question answer session. The open digital innovation by the Indian government has been leveraged by the startup community, making India now the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. 
It seems that India's tech scene is creating successful multinational businesses faster than ever before. IT development in India is at a stage of consolidation. As more and more products reach the masses at lower prices and better infrastructure connects the Indian cities and smaller towns, local economies are changing, creating new jobs for the young India. Emerging nations have a unique opportunity to leapfrog to the next levels of development by identifying their comparable advantage across sectors and value chains and preparing for the future. India's recent advances in technological infrastructure leave the rest of the world far behind. India is now the most attractive major investment opportunity in the world. Thank you for staying with us, Mr. Pai. Um, so do you think that India can succeed in creating a Silicon Valley that can be a competitor or uh, can it be a better Silicon Valley than the Californian one? Well, I think uh, for any country to say they will be better than Silicon Valley will take a lot of doing. Let me explain why. Silicon Valley has first some of the best talent in the world going there because of the opportunities that exist there. They have some of the best digital companies in the world. They have huge amounts of capital, 135 billion goes into venture capital every year in the valley. They have very large universities with a large research budget. They have a very large number of research institutions and research spending. And to create that a scale is not possible at all, either for India or China or Europe. What we can do is to collaborate with the Silicon Valley to be a part of the ecosystem there. In that, Bangalore and India have been very dominant. For example, about 35% of startups in the valley in cyber security is, fund, is, is has an Indian founder. 25% of all startups have an Indian founder. And about 30 to 50% of all startups in the valley have engineering done in India, basically in Bangalore for software. And in the software service industry, most of the large companies have their uh, software services delivered out of Bangalore. 450 of the Fortune 500 companies have their R&D center or software delivered out of Bangalore. So I don't think it's possible for any country to create that infrastructure, which has been going on in the Valley for the last 60 years. But I think we can work together the Valley and become part of the Valley architecture. And that's why for young engineers in India, USA and SFO is closer to us than going to Delhi. When you go to SFO at the Valley, we feel at home. The culture is the same. We talk to people who talk the same language. Whereas you go to Delhi, you know, it's very different. It's the capital of India, but it's very political. They speak a different language and a different attitude together. So my 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 answer would be that um, you can't duplicate that. It's going to take a lot of doing. People talk about it, but it's very difficult because so many things have fallen in place. But you can cooperate with them, work with them as a partner. And that's what Bangalore has done and India has done. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pai, for your answers. And it was very nice to have you on the show. Now, viewers, People on social media platforms have also shared their thoughts, which we feel that uh, you should really watch. Let's see how people all around the world are viewing India's technological advances. Amitar Kant describes Bengaluru as the India's most innovative city and the second largest technology cluster after Silicon Valley. Prime Minister Modi believes that India is an active contributor to the fourth industrial revolution and it is certainly a matter of pride. Mahendra Nath Pandey also believes that India has made progress in different fields of the digital technology and in the future India will lead the fourth industrial revolution. Marketplace claims the Indian tech industry hit $150 billion mainly due to the American companies outsourcing IT work and software development. Akhil Qureshi's tweet is about India dropping six places to 59th based on the IMD World Talent Ranking. And now is the time to sign off this episode and you can follow us on our social media platforms to stay updated. We'll meet the same time, same day next week. Thanks for watching.